Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12060 Trusts. We're in week four. Tonight we're dealing with constructive trusts and resulting trusts. There aren't many certainties, but you can be certain that this will be on the exam. So the good news is we can pay attention and we can, um, uh, we can uh, anticipate that uh, what we cover tonight will be covered in the exam. All right, so I'm told that so far people are finding it quite difficult, as in trusts, but we're going to change that and make it a bit easier. I'm just going to change my name, so it's John Milburn, although I suspect you probably know that. Okay. Um, in terms of resulting in constructive trusts, the first thing to consider is that there is a basic distinction between trusts that are deliberately created and those that are brought into existence as a result of a court order. So to get you going, can anyone tell me what would be an example of a trust that is created deliberately? And, and what's the generic term for deliberately created trusts? Anyone? You can unmute your microphone, use the chat facility if you like. Express trust, fixed trust. Yes, express. I like that, that's good. So an express trust is a deliberately created trust. Now, I'm going to suggest that there are maybe three or four pretty quick obvious examples of an express trust. That is one that's deliberately created. Can you give me some of those? All right, we're getting nothing yet. Yes? Any thoughts? Did someone unmute, ready to give an answer? All right, we're getting some discretionary trusts, super fund trusts, testamentary trust, inter vivos trust, transfer of property. Yep, they're all fine. So remember at week one, we talked about an easy express trust, which is a bare trust where, I don't know, somebody at a, uh, you know, I, went on, I think I told you I went on a golfing trip, or eight of us. We all had to put in $50, the winner takes all, or what percentage of it. The guy who was organising it looked to me and said, well, you're a lawyer, you, you can be trusted with the money. So I had these eight lots of $50 I had to carry around all week on a bare trust to distribute later on. So a bare trust. I didn't have to do anything more with it other than keep it safe. We've talked about the simple trusts, which are deliberately created, which is where a grandmother gives money to um, a mother to open, put into a bank account for the benefit of a granddaughter. So that's another simple one. Last week, we talked about discretionary trusts, unit trusts. Nobody said unit trust. I was waiting for that to come up on the screen. And we talked about testamentary trusts. Um, we talked about protective trusts within the context of a will. So there's lots of different types of trusts. Now, testamentary trusts and protective trusts Testamentary is possibly a constructive trust, but we'll look at that a little later. But the point is that we've got these express trusts which are deliberately created. Now, this is an easy question. Why are resulting trusts and constructive trusts different to express trusts? Constructive trust is usually ordered by the court. Yes. Yes, court, created by the court. We're getting a lot of those coming through. Okay, so trusts which are resulting or constructive really need a court to announce that this is what they are. And the reason for that is that the court needs to objectively consider the circumstances presented to it and then make a finding. And that finding will be, this is a resulting trust, the finding will be this is a constructive trust. So that's the basic difference. So when it comes to considering resulting trusts and constructive trusts, we can say that they are, if you like, non-consensual trusts, as opposed to express trusts, which are consensual. So resulting trusts can be created in a couple of different ways. What are those two ways that a resulting trust can be created or categorised rather. How do we categorise a resulting trust? Automatic or presumed? Yes, yes, automatic or presumed. Exactly. Thank you, Linda. 
And that's what's saying, automatic or presumed. Okay. So let's look at that. Now- I tried to sum it up, but I just- oh, oh. It's easy on the phone. Are you there, Vivian? We're just hearing you through the microphone. Thank you very much, that's great. All right, and feel free to unmute your microphones at any stage or to take the video, um, uh, you know, to, to put the video on so we can see each other, that's good too. Okay, so now we're starting to get to a situation where trusts are either consensual or non-consensual. Trusts, resulting trusts, are either presumed or automatic. So it's starting to sound a bit like a complex restaurant order. So a bit like this, a man goes in to a restaurant sits down and says to the waiter, I'd like a trust, please. And the waiter says, um, would you like your trust consensual or non-consensual, sir? Um, I'd like a non-consensual trust, thank you. Would you like your non-consensual trust to be a resulting trust or a constructive trust, sir? Uh, I'd like a resulting trust, thank you. Would you like your resulting trust to be a presumed trust or an automatic trust? Presumed resulting trust, thank you. So it's it just layered. Now, the point that I'm trying to make by that analogy is that it's really good idea to create a list of definitions or a flow chart that makes sense to you. That way you can keep referring back to it because on their own, each of these concepts is really quite simple. Where I think it gets confusing is we've got so many different names for things. A bit like criminal law, I say that criminal law is great because if you're practicing in criminal law, nobody's listening apart from us, are they? This is, I, can, I, can, I can talk freely. Um, in criminal law, we have a lot of different terms, noli prosequi, you know, voir dires, um, things that really sound technical, 590 double A's, all these sorts of things. In reality, they're very easy. They're just terms that we use for a simple concept, but it makes it sound hard. It's a little bit like that with trusts as well. So let's try to create something for future reference that works for you. Okay, so we're now talking about resulting trusts and we're talking about presumed resulting trusts. And Linda told us before that the alternative to a presumed resulting trust is an automatic resulting, re resulting trust. But well, type one, presumed. So if you provide money to purchase an item and it's registered in somebody else's name, the law presumes that you intended the registered owner to hold the property on trust for you. You pay the money, so the law says you have the beneficial interest. That's through a resulting trust. So are we pretty clear on that basic principle as to what a presumed resulting trust is? If we haven't got it, we need to make sure of that. If you're looking at this later, Make sure you stop the video and uh, get that concept right. Okay. John, when, yes. John, when does it, something like that become a gift? Oh, yes, that, that, exactly. Um, if the evidence is such that the presumption is not correct, then it becomes a gift. And we can talk about that shortly. Because when we say it's a presumed resulting trust, what we're really saying is there's a presumption that this is what it is, but you can overcome that presumption by leading evidence to the contrary. Now, when it, Brad says, onus of proof to be on the recipient. Yes. So, um, well, yes and no. Um, if the person who is the registered owner is challenged by the person who provided the money, or sorry, round the other way around. Brad's right. So if the person who is registered is challenged by the person who paid the money, the person who's registered can say, no, it was a gift and I'll prove it was a gift and here's the evidence to suggest that it was a gift. So Brad's right. It is a reversal of the onus that we normally see. Okay, so now there are two presumed resulting trusts. We've been talking about presumed resulting trust. So um, let's go back to our, innate, our fellow in the restaurant and he asks a further question. Um, or the waiter says, would Sir like his presumed resulting trust um, because of the advancement of purchase money 
or because of the voluntary transfer of property and the, the person gives an answer and says, no, it's as a result of the advancement of purchase money. So what we're doing there is we're saying there's a further breakdown. So a presumed resulting trust can be as a result of advancing purchase money or voluntarily transferring property. So they're both forms of presumed resulting trusts. Um, how do I describe those two? Or do we get it? Do we, do we understand the difference between providing funds that are used to purchase a property as opposed to a transfer of property? That's pretty straightforward. Yep, B's nodding, Brad's nodding, all good, all right. So if you want a more formal statement of the proposition as it relates to the two types of presumed resulting trusts, have a look at the um, judgment of Lord Brown Wilkinson in Westdeutsch Landsbank, Giro Central, against Islington London Borough Council. That's 1996, Appeal Court, which is AC 669 at 708. It's a pretty good statement. So that's Lord Brown Wilkinson in Westdeutsch Landsbank, Giro Central, against Islington London Borough Council. 96 AC 669, go to page 709. Okay, now, as Linda said before, this is a presumption. This is, and Brad said, we can, we can prove actual intent. And we do that by adding, adducing evidence. It's a court matter, of course. So we're adducing evidence to say this is the actual intent. The actual intent was, it's a gift. Um, so it can be rebutted by that direct evidence. Is the test one of that is subjective or objective? How will the court go about determining whether or not it was? What, how will the court determine the actual intention? Adopting a subjective or objective test. Let's have your votes. I've got one vote for objective, one for subjective. Linda has unmuted. Subjective, subjective, or subjective? Sorry, objective. objective. Hit the wrong button. All right. Okay, we've, we've, got a, we've got a mixture of answers. I'm going to go with, uh, Melissa says, I'm going to go with objective. Um, generally speaking, if a court has to consider intention, it will do so objectively. In other words, they are inquiring as to what the intent of the person was, but they determine the answer as to what that person's intent was by looking objectively at all of the facts. One of those facts will be the evidence given by the person to say, this is what I thought, this is what I intended, but it's not conclusive. Otherwise, all you'd need to do is get the person in the witness box and say, I intended it to be um, you know, a gift, or I didn't intend it to be a gift, uh, or whatever it might be. And that would be the answer. But it's objective. The court will consider all the evidence and then make a decision as to whether uh, the intention was there or not. Okay. So let's talk about voluntary transfer of property. We said before that there are two ways that this type of trust can come into existence. Someone pays the money or they simply voluntarily transfer property. They tra A transfers property to B, B pays nothing for it. It's a voluntary transfer. The law presumes this was not a gift. That's the presumption. That's the starting point. In most circumstances, that's the case. There is an exception, but most of the time, the court will say this is not a gift. That's the presumption. So when you come across something where there is a presumption, think of it this way. Think of it as a reference point. Think of it as a starting point. That's all it is. The court says, we have to work this out. Where do we start? Well, the presumption is it was not a gift. Let's start there. We might as well. The law says we'll start there. So what that means is Brad identified the burden shifts to the other party to say it was a gift, and they do that by, true, by uh, proving it. And they lead evidence to that effect. Okay, let's look at a case. There's a case of... Uh, Mashinsky and Dobbs 
It was 1985, it was in the High Court. The reference is 1985, 160, CLR, at 583, and Brad's ahead of me, he's on to family court, and um, yep, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. So in Mashinsky and Dodds, Gibbs said, um, we have to determine whether or not this was a gift, and the court considered the evidence of a solicitor who was acting in the purchase transaction, and that evidence, and the evidence of the parties, was all considered. So the court considered all the evidence as to whether or not there was this intention or not, and the court concluded that there was sufficient evidence to satisfy it that the A did intend to confer an immediate and unconditional beneficial interest on B, even though B contributed less than 10% of the purchase price. So answer, to answer your question now, Linda, about how do you prove it was a gift, uh, have a look at that, that, or it was not a gift, um, as the case may be, have a look at Mashinsky and Dodds. Okay, so we're starting with a presumption and we're then working on a situation where evidence might be adduced to counter that presumption. All right, if we're not confused enough, and we're not, I'm sure you're with me on this. We're good? All right. Um, we said that there was a presumption. The presumption is it's not a gift. However, there is another presumption which works contrary to the first one, which is even more powerful than the first one. And it's a presumption of advancement. And the presumption of advancement is where the parties are in a relationship. One has an obligation to provide for the welfare and maintenance of the other. Then, Brad, what will the court do? Sorry, I'm missing. What's your question? What will the court do in the event of an advancement? Yes. Where's the starting point then? Well, then they would assume that it was a gift, contrary to any evidence that suggests otherwise. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Thank you. And I, and I, and I picked on you there, Brad, because I saw you put it up on the, um, on the, the screen, and um, B wrote that as well on the chapter. Oh. Well, well, really, what I was saying there is that um, in the family court, if it's if it's if there's no documentation that suggests it's a loan, it's considered a gift, um, and then the other party can rebut to say it was a gift to an individual, not to the relationship. So the mm -hmm. onus is on the individual to then prove that it was a gift to the individual and not to the relationship. Right. Okay. So that's taking it a bit further. And that, that brings into Section 79 of the Family Law Act, and we'll talk about that shortly as well. So where you've got parties in a relationship, things are different. So that general rule doesn't apply. And in fact, we presume the opposite. Um, and again, advancement is just simply a presumption, and it, be, it can be countered through providing evidence. All right. So what we've been talking about mostly is a presumed resulting trust. What's the alternative to a presumed resulting trust, Linda? An automatic, yes, I, I, I could see you say that. All right, automatic. Okay, so what's an automatic trust? What does that mean? When does it come into existence? When would we consider asking the court to make an order about an automatic resulting trust? When you had a express trust, but it failed for some reason. Spot on, exactly. All right, so just as a reminder, can someone give me an example of four express trusts? What's an express trust? You'll have to unmute your microphone, somebody. I need someone to tell me. We had bear trust, fixed trust, uh, what else do we do? Unit trust. I'm missing one, I'm missing one. Discretionary trusts. Discretionary trust, yep. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. So those intentionally created trusts, they're express trusts. Where you get one that is mucked up, then we have to work out what's happening. And that's where someone can apply to a court to ask the court to make an order to the effect that the failed express trust 
is in fact an automatic trust. It's where there is an attempt to make an express trust for the, fails for technical reasons, or it's formed for a purpose and that purpose is completed, but the trust properly remains. Okay, let's go back to that decision of um, Westdeutsch Land Bank and um, Islington. In that instance, Lord um, Brown Wilkinson said, where A transfers property to B on an express trust, but the trust declared not to exhaust the whole beneficial interest, then by operation of law, an automatic resulting trust is created. So that's kind of the technical term. But I like Linda's definition. If the express trust, the attempt to create the express trust fails, then we've got an automatic trust. So how could possibly an express trust fail? What are some of the reasons why an express trust might fail? I've kind of alluded to a few. Um, so it could be uh, exceeding the powers of able under statute of a trustee. Yes, yes, exceeding ex excessive power, ultra virus, uncertainty, says B. Yep, that's a good one as well. Last week, do you remember we not constituted, says Monica? I like that too. Remember last week we talked about perpetuities? Who can someone remember what perpetuities is? and why that might be relevant now in this discussion. 80 is the, is the number. 80 is spot on for the number of per, for perpetuities. But what's the rule against perpetuities? What does that mean? We know it's 80, 80, yes? Plus, plus, 20, plus 21 years, plus nine months. Oh, okay. It says that, uh, yeah, the, that's gotta be someone who's born or, you know, who's yep. in existence, who is over 21 years or about then, to be 21 yeah. years of age. Um, yeah. That is a beneficiary. You cannot uh, give it to somebody who is, uh, yeah, so you cannot say you can't have a trust to have someone who is not yet, or who's not yet born, who has to reach an age beyond 21 in order to receive the, the yep. ben benefit. Okay, so the rule against perpetuities, which is in the Property Law Act, 1974 Queensland, have a look at that, is basically intended to stop people from tying property up way into the future. So if you created an express trust, which gave the beneficiary certain entitlements in the year um, 2200, uh, that could be struck down on the basis that it breaches the rule against perpetuities. So that's another example of where the express trust might fail. So there are other reasons why no remaining beneficiaries. Yeah, that might be another good reason as well. So sometimes there are legal requirements. You know, a trust must be in writing, for example. Um, Brad says, how does a Grosvenor trust continue? I, d I don't know what a Grosvenor trust is. Sorry, Brad, you've got me there. The Grosvenor trust owns um, most of Fleet Street in um, the UK. Oh. There's a trust established and it continues to pass on, you know, like, you know, through the royalty link. And I was just wondering whether that has been changed under yeah. statute in the UK, but that's been going for yeah. you know, hundreds yeah. of years. Okay. I, um, I might have a look at that rule against perpetuities in this context. I think that a trust can have a life that's more than 80 years, but I think it's more to do with the distribution of funds to an individual or a class of individuals that isn't triggered for, you know, past 80 years. So a trust can be ongoing each year, but it's making its distribution. That's fine. But it's where you're trying to lock something up for 150 years, for example, you know, and not do anything with it in that situation. Um, I recall many, many years ago when I first set up a family trust, um, the perpetuity I thought was 80 years or um, the last surviving um, descendant of King Henry VIII or Queen Victoria I or, or something along those lines. Um, mm. uh, obviously, it must have changed at some stage in the last 30 years. But. Mm -hmm. have, have a look at the, as I said, the Property Law Act. And that will give you a good starting point. Okay. 
Mm. What happens during mm. the surplus in trust, trust property, particularly after the trust has been settled and something more is discovered? Something more, as in more property, do you mean, Erin? Yes. Um, and the, pro the trust has been settled. Well, that's a tricky one. I, I guess really it, it would be a matter of some form of application to the court to determine what to do with it. I know that's a very simplistic answer, but I think that's realistically all that you could consider doing. Um, if the trust has been wound up, then it's a bit like a company being wound up, assets being determined after the event. It's a matter of then finding out, uh, seeking the guidance of the court. A bit of a cop-out answer, Erin, but it's the best I can come up with at the moment. So. No, actually, in the textbook, it says it goes back to the creator. It's oh. presumed the creator intended to receive any leftover beneficial interest. Of course, of course, that, that would be the answer, of course. So, um, which is a basic rule, isn't it, where the trust has failed. If we go back to that definition that I mentioned just before of um, Lord um, uh, Brown Wilkinson, he actually said that where the trust does not exhaust the whole beneficial interest. So by inference, yes, if there is a further beneficial interest, then the resulting trust would apply in those circumstances. Okay, I think that's that's an excellent response. And, and if the creator has since passed away, it would go back to the estate, would it? I guess it would have to, yes. I couldn't see any other alternative than that. All right, thank you. All right, so... There are some reasons why an express trust might fail. I've mentioned a couple of cases. The other one that I want you to have a look at is, or at least be aware of, is in re Vandeville's trust, number two. It's 1974, one chancery, which is CH, at 269. You've probably come across these cases in your readings. Uh, good idea to add a few of these in. You know, trust law is a bit interesting in that um, when we're teaching law now, we don't often really talk about English cases that off, uh, that much, but we do in trust law. It's, it, it all started medieval England, so there's a lot of it flows on. And our Trusts Act is not a code, as we discussed last week with the Trust Act. Okay, so other express trust failures, because the trust is void, uncertain or the perpetuity rule or illegality because the trust is unenforceable did not fill statutory formality requirements such as writing because the intended beneficiary predeceases the testator or because the intended beneficiary uh, disclaims or refuses their interest which you wouldn't think happens very often but that's another reason why we may have a failure and we did talk briefly about the Family Law Act. In all of this, bear in mind that many of the cases that um, are in existence because of resulting in constructive trusts came about as a result of personal relationship breakdowns. A lot of this is now flavoured by or even superseded by provisions of the Family Law Act. And in particular, have a look at section 79 of the Act and section 79 gives power to the family court and the federal circuit court to alter property interests on dissolution of marriage uh, without, um, without regard to the presumption of a resulting trust or advancement. Okay. Brad, did you wanna add something there about child maintenance trusts? Uh, yeah, um, the creator of a child maintenance trust can never receive the benefit of the corpus. Okay. Um, so it, may, it may well go back to the settler. Okay. But gen generally, it would go. Um, I'm pretty sure I've reviewed one the other day, and the conditions of the trust is it went to the benefactors of, uh, to the estate of the benefactors, um, and not to the benefit of the um, of the father. Okay. Thank you. So, so it far it had far one of the requirements under the tax ruling. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so let's morph into, let's segue into um, constructive trusts. 
One of the differences between a resulting trust and a constructive trust relates to the court order when either of those things is found. So in the case of a resulting trust, the presumed intention of a party to a transaction, once it's determined by a court objectively, gives recognition with rights, the important rights, to the pre-existing resulting trust. It means that the resulting trust is what we call a property institution. Um, a constructive trust is not a property institution. It's a court ordered remedy to effectively right a wrong. I think I've given away a slogan to a law firm, um, but that's essentially what a constructive trust is all about. And if you're really interested, you can have a look at, again, Lord Brown Wilkinson in uh, Wish Deutsch Lands Bank, Giro Central against Islington. And he distinguished between an institutional constructive trust, um, which is arising by operation of law, which is merely to declare that the trust has arisen, and a remedial constructive trust, which is where the court creates a constructive trust. The, create, the um, triggering event does not derive from any pre-existing or fiduciary or contractual relationship. So do have a look at that case. That was again at 708. As an exam tip, it would be good to have a few of these quotes ready to go. Okay, so if a plaintiff fails to establish a resulting trust, a court may still address an unconscionable denial of beneficial interest by imposing a constructive trust. There is another thing, another type of remedy or two that the court consider. So I'm, I'm working my way towards constructive trusts and I'm just identifying the difference between resulting and constructive. And I'm saying, if you apply for a resulting trust order and you fail, don't give up because the court may give you a remedy through ordering that this is a constructive trust. But there are two other sort of remedies, equitable remedies, that the court may consider or they may make a declaration in relation to these things. A bit cryptic. Like, uh, um, like tracing or account of profits? Yes. There. compensation? The damages, specific performance, tracing, compensation, restitution, they're all, they're all remedies that the court may consider. Um, but in terms of how the court might view the uh, substantive issues, what I was looking for is that the court may regard this as an equitable charge, is another alternative, or they may even invoke equitable estoppel. So just keep those things in mind, um, that annexed to a resulting trust or a constructive trust, we may have equitable charge, or we may have perhaps equitable estoppel. Don't be too hung up on that. You don't need to do extra research. You can if you like, but just be aware that that's another way that the court might look at these things. So if you're drafting these sorts of proceedings on behalf of a party, you need to be mindful of the fact that in your pleadings, you outline your primary case and then plead in the alternative that if the court is against you on a resulting trust, then you seek an order for constructive trust, etc. Okay, so what's a constructive trust? What does, what does that mean? And why would the court make an order for a constructive trust? Can someone explain a constructive trust way easier than uh, that? Yes, Brad? I think the court um, doesn't have the power to um, create um, a legal interest at the registry. So they create um, a, the equitable interest through a constructive trust, which would then um, effectively have an equitable charge over the interest in that property. Okay. Makes sense. Yes. I, I can't remember, I hated property law um, and I'm sure it was something to do with the courts didn't have the power to um, 
essentially insert that the person's interest on the registry a t- of title. So they weren't able to change the title, but they could create the trust to identify the equitable interest. I think it was also when there was an incomplete um, contract too in the sale of the property. Okay, yes. So a construction trust, yes, sorry. I was just going to say that um, in a family court matter where um, one of the parties has disposed of the assets um, to defraud the property pool, um, the court brings it back to a, the, the person who is holding that, who has had notice and has not paid um, proper value for it. Um, they hold it on constructive trust for the property settlement. Okay, good. I like these things. Yep. Thank you, Vivian. Yeah, sorry. Can I make a note there that actually the court has the power to reverse the transaction <clears throat> and then the aggrieved party can then be appointed as the trustee on sale of the asset. Um, J- Judge Jarrett no, made that ruling a couple of years ago on a property. Thank you, Brad. Um, and speaking of trustees for sale, there is, again, referring back to the Property Law Act, the option of applying independently of anything to do with family law for the appointment of trustees for sale in certain circumstances where you have a dispute between joint owners. But I am digressing a bit. So let's come back to constructive trusts. What we're really saying is that if the circumstances are such that it would be inequitable by reference to established equitable principles for B to deny obligations of trusteeship, then by operation of law, the law creates a constructive trust. So in those circumstances, a court has power to make an order that B, the owner, holds property, which he has legal title to, on trust for A. And that's what Brad, I think, was saying, that they can't actually put it in A's name, but they can make that order that there is a constructive trust and that B doesn't own the property outright anymore. B now owns the property on a constructive trust for A. So the registered owner is dragged into this dispute. The court is saying, like it or not, you're coming to the trust party. The court will hold B liable as if he were the legal trustee. He's now a constructive trustee, has the same effect. So someone who knowingly assists a fiduciary to breach an obligation will be accountable as a constructive trustee as well. So be careful if you're an advisor in those circumstances. So constructive trusts really come into effect by operation of law, don't they? There's no, no one's made a decision. No one, no, you're not going to be in practice as a solicitor and, say, and someone comes in and says, um, I'd like you to draw up a constructive trust for me. You know, that's, that's sort of sending them out for the long wait or the heavy wait or whatever it is. Um, so it comes into effect by operation of law. And it would be, it comes into effect where the court says it would be fraudulent or it would be unconscionable to deny the existence of a trust. It just wouldn't be fair to allow this person to get away with it. They shouldn't be the owner. They are the owner, but now they hold this property on trust for someone else who made the application to a court. So the court will make the uh, determination about the existence of the trust without reference to the intention of the parties. They'll just look at the, the, the facts and what's fair. Um, oh, so what, what does that mean? I mean, does it mean they, the, the, now you can kick the, got the constructive trustee out of the property or? Yes, yes. Um, we're, we're not really going into the remedies for it, but you're right. If the court finds a remedial constructive trust would be contrary to the legal principles, then the owner of the property is stopped, as in a stopper, from asserting a right to absolute ownership of that property. So it may be, for example, that part of the order you seek is to sell the property, or it may be to 
um, force the um, existence of the trust to be noted on title, or it might be to um, somehow have an order for compensation. But yeah, it needs some enforcement remedy to go with it. So equity says that we are trying to restore parties back to a situation that is fair in all the circumstances. And one of the ways they do that is by making a declaration to the effect that there is a constructive trust with respect to a particular property. Now, there are lots of different ways that, that can be done. Again, uh, many of these things were done in the context of family law and people were saying that um, contributions to a property can be direct, but they can be non-direct. Non they could be support, providing homemaking, family care, and all those sorts of things that we, we now see in the realm of family law proceedings. So constructive trusts, I guess, are less important now than they were before 1975 when we brought in no-fault divorce and the Family Law Act. But to answer your question a little more, B, the equitable remedy is flexible and it's discretionary. So a court can award the minimum ready, uh, remedy that it believes is appropriate for justice to be given. Um, it can impose a constructive trust or it can make other remedies. It can say, well, look, we're not going to create the trust, but we will limit your entitlement. Uh, or even if they do create a trust, they can say, well, we're creating a trust, but we're limiting it to your entitlement, uh, to contributions to the property, and that'll be secured by a trust or it might be secured by an equitable charge. Sometimes the courts say, we're going to make the order for the constructive trust, but we're going to go beyond an order that you are entitled to simply recover what you put into it. That's another alternative. What do you think the court would consider as an appropriate order in those circumstances? Not just- Would they get interest? Would they be entitled to interest on the funds they've contributed? They're probably entitled to interest on the funds they contributed as a minimum, as yes. But let's say B owns a property which is worth a million dollars. And let's say that that property was purchased for $100,000 30 years ago. The amount of money that A, the claimant put into the money, into the property originally, or the value of the constructive trust might be half the value of the property. So the alternatives for the court might be to say, all right, A, eh? we, we accept there is a constructive trust, not for the whole lot, but for half the property, or there is constructive trust, um, but it will be for your, the value of what you put into it plus interest. So there could be a big difference between having an order for the amount that you put in plus interest as opposed to getting an order for a percentage of the value of the property in total. So just be mindful of that. The court can go either way. And the remedy is flexible and discretionary um, to answer sort of B's question there. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about a constructive trust, we need to contrast it with other types of trusts. And we already did that for a while. We, we talked about different types of remedies or circumstances. So let's go back to the start and express trust. We know what that is. It's created by the set law. It's an express act. It's not imposed by law. And um, uh, there, there is an intention there. The intention is not necessarily relevant in um, uh, constructive trust. It's not always irrelevant, but um, it can be, um, it can be relevant. Brad says, can you create a constructive trust by consent? Well, you can have a common intention, constructive trust, but the source of the obligation is always the court. So the court may make a finding, but the obligation is imposed, found, declared by the court. And that's one of the hallmarks of a constructive trust. I guess, I guess the reason my question was, um, say, for example, you had one party who had a property worth a million. Um, they were looking to sell, or they, they were 
So, for example, a person <clears throat> wants to take a 50% interest in the property without having to transfer the title and pay all the stamp duties, etc. So they want to register their equitable interest at 50%, <clears throat> but they want to hold that in trust. So how would you go about that? We've got, to be care- we've got to be very careful because if you make a declaration that you hold property in trust for another, then that declaration in itself is um, dutiable. Dutiable, okay. Um, and if you put on title that it's a trust, that'll be dutiable as well. But the actual declaration um, is dutiable when it relates to um, something that would attract duty if it was transferred, like real estate. So just yeah. be very careful of those revenue implications. Okay, so we understand now that the difference between an express trust and a resulting or constructive trust. And we understand the difference between resulting trust and constructive trust. Those big broad areas. We understand those things, yes? Right, good. And remember, there's that layering of how do you want your meal, sir? All the different branches. I Look, I actually haven't done it. So I'm asking you to consider doing something that I haven't done. But if it were me, I'd probably have some sort of flow chart, like a spreadsheet showing this is trust law and here are all the options and how it, how it could go. That way it'll make it very easy in an exam situation for you to say, right, well, here's the factual circumstance. That's really confusing. Let's see which of these ones it, pin, it goes into. And you've got all your, your options there available. A bit like on the, on the menu, sir. Which one do you want? I'll have this one, thank you very much, and I'll have a side of chips with it. And if that doesn't work, if that's not available, if it's not on the menu when you get out to the kitchen, I might try this as an alternative. So that's the way I'd probably approach the uh, answer. Okay, so we said that constructive trusts are imposed by a court to remedy a situation, to make things right. Now, that might be in the first instance, where someone acts unconscionably. So if the court says, look, it is unconscionable for you to deny an equitable interest, that's what you're doing. You're denying the equitable interest. Well, we're, we're making it an equitable interest, whether you like it or not. What you've done is unconscionable. You now have an equitable interest, which is um, imposed upon you. The other thing is wrongdoing. So if um, it's just wrong what they've done, which can be unconscionable as well. Um, And essentially what we're trying to do is prevent something being gained by wrongdoing. Another one is unjust enrichment. Sometimes unjust enrichment means like this. Here's the classic example of unjust enrichment. A builder builds a house, builds it on the wrong block, builds it on on the block next door. You can't move the house, it's there. The owner of the block next door says, you beauty, a free house. Um, Unjust enrichment is an application by the person who caused enrichment somewhere else to claim some compensation because the enrichment was unjust. It's not something that we technically have in Australia, but you can use constructive trusts as a way of um, restoring that situation to remedy a situation where someone is... um, Uh, unjustly deprived of an asset or money. Um, Now, just finally, have a look at the rule in Saunders and Vautier. Uh, That's the... Does anyone know what that rule is before I tell you? No? That wasn't the meddling, was it? No. No. No, sorry. Pretty simple rule. Um... The rule in Saunders and Bortier. See who's first to find it. I can see Peter's looking, Linda's looking. I can't see the others, but I know you're looking. What is what is the rule in Saunders and Bortier? Is that where uh, the beneficiary could require the trustees transfer the property to them? Regardless yes. of the direction of a will? That's it. Who, that was Peter got in first, was it? 
Well done. Yeah, yeah, that, that was me. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So it's where the beneficiaries are full age and can say to the um, require the resulting trustees, transfer the property to me as part of the rule. Okay, very briefly, because I'm almost out of time. We mentioned before testamentary trusts. Um, the, the text, I think it was the text, categorised testamentary trust as a constructive trust. I'm not sure about that, to be honest. I think in some circumstances, if you have a testamentary action, family provision action, that might lead to an order that is akin to a, test, a, a, a constructive trust. But I'm not sure that you can say that a testamentary trust is a constructive trust. I prefer to see it, as we discussed at the outset of this session tonight, as an express trust. Um, and just finally, mutual wills. Not really trust law, but I just thought I'd raise it because it occurred to me when I was preparing for tonight. A mutual will is where you have a contract between two parties to sign wills that are usually attached to the contract. And as you probably know, if you sign a will, you're free to change it any time you like. So you can't give away that right by contract. But if you sign a, a mutual will, what you're really doing is saying to typically your partner, I am committing to you that I this is my will and I'm not changing it. You, you walk into the uh, another firm next door and uh, change it the next day, and the next one is, is perfectly valid. But you're then in breach of contract, the contract being a mutual will. I don't know why I really threw that in. It's got nothing to do with constructive trusts, but I just thought it was interesting. Okay. Um, are we all good? Does everyone understand? We started the night saying trust is hard, I'm, I'm finding difficult. Now it's easier? Yes? No? <laughs> It's too much to remember. It's trying to get some way of putting that into something that's manageable is a difficult part. Flow charts and a list of definitions so that you've got your terminology. Yes, terminology is a problem. And think of it like that restaurant thing, all these layerings. Um, John, is there um, a, a hint that you can give us of where we can go and find how to set out a pleading like essentially oh, okay. is some we can go and look obviously which in regards to the assignment which we're all studiously working towards um just wondering i mean obviously i mean i know, I know what a pleading looks like but how you want how you know was this, you was know, this like writing an essay we'd use iraq or syrac or something yeah. and so like, was this um was this a submission that we're, we're preparing, an outline of submission, an outline of argument? Yeah, outline of mm -hmm. submission, yeah. B, B gave us one, didn't she? Right, in uh, you crew. As I was just wondering, did you want, because that one, they, they made us put all the cases uh, there. Did you want the, the cases in the footnotes or did you want it like that with all the cases under it? Yeah, look, it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't worry me too much. And there's, there's no um, absolute prescribed form, Brad. Um, and I'm, when, I, when I talk about I want something that looks professional, I'm really talking about I don't want a mismatch of, um, you know, fonts and things of that nature. But you can lay it out in a manner that looks right to you. So don't worry too much about the prescribed form. But just as an idea, if you want to look at the uniform civil forms, uh, that will give you a good idea of a basic layout of court documents. We're getting a bit of screaming there. I'm not sure where that's coming from. But I'm not no, sure. it's, just, it's just the dog here playing with oh. a toy. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. All right, thank you. Sorry, can you say, repeat that again? Where do you go to get the forms? Yep. If you go to the court's website, Queensland Court's website, and go on a link called Forms, it will take you to various forms that we use in civil procedure. If you want an outline, that's a really good place to start. So the problem is that if I put all the cases there, then it will go into the word limit. It will go into the word, but if I put it in the footnotes, then it wouldn't count. It doesn't count. So toss them in the footnotes if you're really desperate. Won't count. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much. I've got to go, and some of you yeah, will Yeah, sorry. Where are the answers to the previous week's questions? I haven't, I haven't got them yet, B. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I will get them to you. All right. John, just quickly as well, I put up in one of the weeks under the one of the weekly question things because I couldn't get onto Moodle. I put up um, a link to writing submissions that another uni oh. put out. Oh, good. Okay. Where where did you put I that? Don't any, yeah, Is I don't it... know if anyone's had a look at. I did suggest though to get your approval first because it was from another university. Oh, that's good. No, other universities have great material. Um, Okay, was that in you crew? Was it, Erin? Did you say? So I ended up putting it in one of the where you answer the weekly problems. I think it was oh, in okay. week two, right. week three. Yeah. yeah, and I'm behind in looking at those answers, so I haven't seen it yet. But all right, no, that's great. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, I'm in catch up mode. We're all getting there. We'll see you next week, and um, all the best. Bye.